So before we begin, just a small announcement. Uh, as you all know, Eureka 66 is still up for sale. So please contact the committee if you would like your copy of our own magazine. And this talk will be recorded. Uh, I still encourage all of you to keep your camera on. So today we have with us uh, Dr. Steven Strogatz, who's a Jacob Gould Sherman Professor of Applied Maths at Cornell University. And he has been a Marshall Scholar at Trinity College, Cambridge. So he was with us here for two years. His research includes problems in nonlinear dynamics and mathematical biology, in particular, the collective behavior of oscillators, something which he'll be talking about today. So on that note, we are very glad to have you with us today, Stephen. Thank you, Parth. Oh, I'm very happy to be back. And uh, Archimedes is one of my favorites, if not my favorite mathematician. So it's a special honor to be able to speak to the Archimedeans. Um, all right, let me begin by sharing my screen. One of these uh, fine gentlemen is actually here with us today, Professor Alex Townsend. I see his face. Hey, Alex. <laughs> Alex also spent some time at Cambridge, and um, he is a citizen of the UK. So anyway, Alex was the lead author on this work that I want to describe to you today about dense networks that don't manage to synchronize and sparse ones that do. Uh, Mike Stillman is another one of our colleagues in the math department at, at Cornell, who um, is our third author on this paper. So the setting, as Parth mentioned, I've been interested in oscillators um, in biology for a long time. And so you've probably heard of this incredible phenomenon of fireflies in Southeast Asia, in places like Thailand or Malaysia that every night gather in the mangrove trees along the rivers and um, tidal rivers that lead out to the sea. And they will, it, the male fireflies will start to flash in sync with one another. So if you've never seen it, it really is pretty amazing. But um, here's an example. Let's look in the top left. You may get the sensation that it's not really perfect synchrony, that they're not all flashing at the same time, but but there appear to be waves of light propagating along. Um, so that is one possible coordinated behavior of the fireflies, wave propagation. Sometimes they do seem to all flash in unison. It's a little more dramatic um, and, and conspicuous in a way if you look at this next example of neurons in sync. Here, the neurons wouldn't normally be visible as they're firing. They, they wouldn't flash like the fireflies do, but these neurons have been treated with a calcium sensitive dye so that whenever they um, fire, when they fire, then this calcium sort of lights up and you can actually see them flashing all pretty much simultaneously. These are neurons that have been grown in a dish, um, neurons taken from the thalamus or the cortex of a, a mammal. All right, so anyway, there are lots of examples of synchronization in the natural world. And um, what we're interested in here today is under what conditions will all the oscillators in a big population end up getting in sync, all flashing at the same time. So the description that I'll be using frequently is a picture like this one, where rather than dealing with the, the details of real neurons or real fireflies, um, we'll think about an abstract point running around on a circle. I see there's a remark in the chat already. Let's see if it's something I should be paying attention to. Yeah, ah, sorry. Yes, Don't that's Yuri making a good comment. That yeah. yes, you, I, I love it if you ask questions during the talk. Please don't let me just um, power on. If you have, uh, you can raise your hand. You could put something in the chat. I will look from time to time. You could even call out verbally, I wouldn't mind. I'd like it to be as interactive as it can be. Um, so definitely don't save your questions for the end. Okay, yeah, thank you, Yuri. Good point. So anyway, you know, there's this thing people talk about the color wheel, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, violet. And violet is sort of perceptually close to red. So colors on the color wheel encode the phases of an oscillator moving around a limit cycle. Um, through its state space in a very nice way. And so I'll make use of that. We're going to represent a, an oscillating system by a point running around a circle. And so um, there you see an abstract 
you know, just an arrow moving around a circle, but notice the way the colors are changing through the color wheel. So that's the, gonna be the code that we'll use when we wanna show oscillators getting in sync, you'll see them uh, behaving with the same color at the same time. For instance, look at the complicated graph in the lower right, where you've got um, lots of different oscillators at different phases. The graph is showing which ones influence which other ones, sort of which ones are connected to which. So it's some complicated graph, but, uh, and at the moment they're not in phase, but if I let it run very quickly, they all manage to get in phase with each other, get in sync. So that's the kind of behavior we're gonna be interested in, systems that spontaneously synchronize like that. All right, now the math behind this is um, based on a model proposed by a Japanese statistical physicist named Yoshiki Kuramoto, who is still alive, um, must be 80 something years old. But back in 1975, he proposed a really nice, elegant, and mathematically tractable model of systems of oscillators that can spontaneously synchronize. And so let me walk you through the main ideas of it. Here's our theta, the angle on the circle, um, running around on the circle at some rate, d theta by dt. And it runs at a rate, omega, that's its natural frequency. And we're gonna assume that all the oscillators I going from one up to n, so there's n of them, they all have the same natural frequency omega. So they would all tend to run at the same speed, but there's interactions between them as encoded in this term. Now what's going on there is those are terms that tend to make oscillators either speed up or slow down in such a way as to bring them potentially into synchrony with each other. So first of all, uh, there's a term AIJ, which you should think of as being filled, it's a matrix filled with zeros and ones. Zero means that I and J are not connected to each other. They don't influence each other. That would be like fireflies that can't see each other or neurons that are not connected by a synapse or by an electrical connection called a gap junction. So if it's a zero, they're not connected. If it's a one, they are connected with unit strength. So I'm gonna assume everybody is connected with the same strength uh, if they're connected at all, just a unit positive strength. Finally, there's this sign term which is sensitive to the phases of the oscillators. It knows about their thetas. And it has the property that, like just picture two of them to understand what's going on. Think of theta j and theta i as being two points on a circle, like runners running around a circular track. And um, if j is a little bit ahead of i, so that this is a slightly positive number, then you would get sign of some positive number, slightly positive, which would itself be positive. And so the net effect of that interaction would be to add a positive contribution to this omega. Now, remember I said, think of I as being a little bit behind J as they're both running around the track. And so that means that this interaction will tend to make the slower one, the one that's behind speed up, right? It gets a positive increment to its omega. So it would make the laggards speed up and it, and it actually makes the, um, faster ones that are ahead slow down. So it tends to bring them into phase. That's the effect of the sign coupling. Uh, what else to say about that? I guess that's it really. Uh, maybe can, one can other I? thing to mention. Oh yes, I was gonna say the AIJ should be symmetric. So if I is connected to J with unit strength, J is also connected back to I with unit strength. But was there a question or a comment? Oh yeah, sorry. Um, can I ask, um, so just looking at the formula for mm -hmm these oscillators. It seems like if uh, two oscillators are not in phase, but um, in, uh, what's the term? So in anti-phase? Yes, an anti-phase. Then that also seems like a stable point. Good so point, interesting. Do we also right, get so a, is that You're observing, Yuri, that if these phase differences are pi, then there would be no, is that what you're interested in? Yeah, yes. Yes, I was wondering, do, do we get an effect that sometimes rather than uh, coming into sync. Is well, that's, um, okay, it's interesting. I mean, you, can, you could certainly set up lots of thetas to be either zero or pi, or to differ by amounts equal to zero or pi. And then they would all run at the same omega. But of course they would not be in phase. And so that's an interesting issue. Is a state like that stable? If perturbed a little, would it come back to that state or would it go away and go to something else? So, um, I mean, as your question anticipates, there are many possible 
equilibrium configurations in the sense that, I mean, by equilibrium, not exactly equilibrium, because they'd all be rotating at speed omega, but, but in terms of relative, equal, relative positions, they would be in equilibrium. And so we have to consider the stability of states like that, as well as others that we're going to discover. Right, good question. Other comments or questions? Um, okay, so anyway, those are the governing dynamics for our system. And keep in mind, I mean, this N, as you can see in these examples, are, you know, 50, 44, 50. These are big dynamical systems. So if you take the Cambridge part, it used to be a part two course on nonlinear differential equations. Um, or now, is there a part two course called dynamical systems? I suppose there probably is. Yeah. Right. Maybe Paul Glendening teaches it or Herbert Huppert or someone like that. Um, I don't know. Those are people who used to teach, but, and that's where I first learned about differential equations, that course, part two. Um, that course focuses a lot on systems of dimension two or three, meaning like in this, in this language, it'd be like two or three oscillators at the most. So doing something with 50 oscillators is a kind of cutting edge branch of dynamical systems. This is a research topic that is, is not the standard thing in a beginning course. On the other hand, because the system is so simple, you'll see there's a lot we can do with it analytically. Okay, so anyway, let me show you some examples. Here's a complicated network, a random network where every node is connected to every other node with some probability here chosen to be one tenth. Um, so most of the edges that could be there are not present, but so like I say, probability one tenth of connection between any pair and then watch what it does. Um, as I let it run. You see that that's apparently sufficient to cause the system to get into sync, that, that level of connection. Now here's an interesting graph where uh, there are 44 oscillators and you see a big black mess. What's really going on is that there are many straight lines showing connections, but there's so many in fact that you can't, can't really see what's going on. It's a very densely connected graph and yet it turns out this one will not spontaneously synchronize. We've set up initial conditions where the phases run through a full cycle as you go around the ring. And um, those phases will stay like that over time. You actually get the sensation of a Mexican wave running around the ring, where I'm using the term Mexican wave to refer to the thing that you may have seen at football games or to an American soccer games, where the fans will all stand up and then sit down you know, causing a wave to rotate around the, the stadium. So you can have these Mexican waves and sometimes they're stable. Look at this next example in the a graph that just is very sparse, only connected, each oscillator only connected to its nearest neighbor on either side. That can also support one of these Mexican waves. That thing will just be stable and run around and if you perturb it slightly, it'll come right back. So we can see lots of different kinds of behavior, either dense graphs that don't synchronize, sparse ones that don't, dense ones that do. Let me see what I've got in the chat, other maybe comments coming up. Is there a reason why we use the sine function, ask Rubiot, rather than just theta i minus theta j? That's a good question. Yes, you could certainly use a linear function, meaning just get rid of the sine function. Like you're taught in, in classical mechanics courses to take the small angle approximation for a pendulum and replace sine theta by theta. So the natural question might be, why don't we do that here? We could just have theta j minus theta, theta i. You could do that. And you're right, that would be very solvable. That's a linear system that you could just quickly write down the answer for. It turns out that doesn't have very rich dynamics though. That system will, um, I think it will pretty much always synchronize. So you don't get anything interesting happening there. The other thing is that theta should not really be regarded as a real number. You should really think of theta as belonging on the circle. Um, and the function, you know, theta is itself sort of strange because of multi-valuedness between zero and two pi. Like, should you treat those as the same state or not? It's a little bit unnatural in a way to, to get rid of the sign, but, but you could, and you're right, it's very solvable. Um, let's see, Joe asks, wouldn't that make it more complicated? as well, because you'd have to work mod two pi, right, getting the idea there. How does the initial condition affect the equilibrium state of the two circles, asks William. Ah, these two, the dense one versus the sparse one? Well, that's a good question, and that's part of what we'll be discussing, right. So, 
Um, here I've chosen the same kind of initial condition for both, but um, we want to get a global understanding of what happens for all kinds of initial conditions. So I don't want to jump ahead just yet. I'll, I'll be getting to that. Uh, so, yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. I, so could it be that instead of like density, the, the factor that decides the syncing up is, is the symmetry of the graph? Because in the mm -hmm. other two, you can think of the pull from either side being the same, so it would not want to go to any particular equilibrium. Nice, right. So we, these are very symmetrical networks, whereas this one is not. Could that be the main, the main issue, symmetry? Um, what, the honest answer to these things is that there, this is a vast wilderness to explore. The, the behavior of large systems of coupled oscillators, even though it's about 50 years old as a subject, you can still ask questions like the one you just asked, and, and we don't have full understanding even today. So I will be discussing later some very highly symmetrical networks where we can make use of the symmetry to find exact results, explicit results for the eigenvalues that govern stability in this problem. So symmetry has its advantages in that we can do a lot of explicit you know, calculations. On the other hand, generically, you don't expect symmetry. So what happens as you depart from symmetry? Um, it's not fully understood. I don't really have much to say, except that, you know, please explore these things on your own afterward. Um, yeah, a lot to do here. Okay, so let me let me move along then. Um, oh, where am I? Yes, so next. Um, this idea of global synchronization. Um, we've already seen that there can be these states like uh, Yuri asked about with zeros and pies. So you can't possibly expect every point in state space, meaning every combination of thetas to lead, have trajectories or solutions leading to everyone in phase. We know there are equilibria that, you know, will not have that, they'll just, they'll just sit there. So that would be too strong a notion of global synchronization, but those points are kind of exceptional. And so what we mean by globally synchronizing is that in the long run, all the oscillators will end up in phase, except possibly for a set of measure zero. Um, you can't rule that out. <clears throat> Definitely have those exceptional cases. But still, if you were picking points at random, you'd have zero chance of hitting those. So in that sense, they're negligible. So synchrony with probability one is what we're going to mean by global synchrony. And so the two questions that arise are, suppose you wanted to make, I mean, the intuition is dense graphs tend to globally synchronize and sparse ones tend to have other attractors other types of long-term behavior. But you could ask, what's the sparsest graph that globally synchronizes? And what's the densest one that doesn't? So it turns out question one is not super interesting as posed, and we can dispense with it pretty quickly. Um, there are ways of refining question one to make it more interesting, but I don't think I'll be getting to that today. But, but really the juicy question that we wanna focus on today is this question two which is what is the densest graph that does not globally synchronize, that has other attracting states, at least locally attracting. So this question has been studied a lot. Um, you can see lots of results, including especially lots of recent results. Here in 2018, there was a breakthrough by this group from New York University led by Ling, um, Alex Townsend, and I and Mike Stillman have some results just from a year ago. Lou and Steinerberger. I mean, this has become hot recently. So I'll, I'll tell you why as we go. All right, so first though, the easy part. Sparse graphs that do globally synchronize. Well, again, let's first clean up the system as written. I mean, this was the system we wrote a few minutes ago. And the fact that everyone has the same frequency omega suggests a kind of natural move, which is to go into a rotating frame, co-rotating at that frequency because then we can get rid of that omega. In other words, if I define a variable theta i hat to be theta i minus omega t, you can see if you substituted for theta i, that would produce theta i hat time derivative plus an omega, and that omega will cancel this omega. While in here, we would just get a theta j hat minus a theta i hat because the common omega t would cancel out when subtracted. So you, you reduce the system then to something that looks like this in terms of the theta hats. You've managed to get rid of the natural frequency. The advantage of that is that 
you know, whereas if I look at this graph with all of its phases and I let it run, it does some kind of complicated thing that even though it's in phase, those are phases are continuing to evolve, they're continuing to blink. In the theta hat representation, what you would see is that everyone has just come to a fixed level, right? All these oscillators would just converge to the same values. They might be separated by two pi. Now remember on the circle that will not show up as any difference because they'll be the same color. So here you've got a lot of reds, but they do differ by two pi, but we don't really care about that. So anyway, in this representation with the theta hats, the problem has boiled down to looking for true equilibrium states of a dynamical system, which is a very manageable problem um, compared to looking for periodic solutions. All right, so now we've boiled it down to this little system and it has a special property, which is that it is a so-called gradient system. It can be written, if I think of the, this side as a vector, you know, collect i from one to n, I write it as theta underbar hat. The time derivative of this vector is given by the negative gradient of a certain potential function, this expression written here with the cosines. And um, gradient systems have a very favorable property, <laughs> which is that on a gradient dynamical system, you can show that the potential behaves monotonically in time. As, as time evolves, uh, the state of the system just keeps moving to lower and lower potential, it just flows downhill on a potential landscape, ending up at an equilibrium point, which is either a saddle point, um, or it could even be a, a local minimum. But that's it. You can't have any kind of more complicated behavior than equilibria in the long run in a gradient dynamical system. In particular, you cannot have periodic behavior because the potential keeps going down as you move, so you couldn't come back to your starting point because you'd be at strictly lower potential. So there are no periodic solutions in gradient systems. There are no strange attractors or chaos or anything interesting. All you have is fixed point behavior, equilibria in the long run. And so that means that we can analyze the long-term behavior by just looking for equilibrium points which in this representation correspond to just setting the right-hand side to zero. So we've boiled the problem down now to looking for the um, zeros of this complicated function. And we want to, in particular, look at the stability of those equilibrium points and ask, are they um, stable to small perturbations or not? That's controlled by looking at the linearization of this system about its equilibrium point. Um, which is given by something called the Jacobian matrix, the, this matrix of partial derivatives at the equilibria. And so you get an expression that looks like this. Okay, so, and I mentioned earlier, AIJ will be taken to be a symmetric matrix of zeros and ones throughout this talk. And so that means that this J sub JK is itself a symmetric matrix. And so why that's interesting and important to notice is that we're going to be concerned with the eigenvalues of this Jacobian matrix. That's what controls the stability of the, the equilibria. And since we're dealing with a symmetric matrix, there's a basic theorem in linear algebra that, that the eigenvalues um, of a real symmetric matrix are themselves real. So we don't have to think about complex eigenvalues. We're just going to have either positive or negative or zero eigenvalues. Okay, so with that in mind, now we can answer this question. What's the sparsest possible synchronizing graph? Um, imagine I have n vertices and I want to make this system globally synchronizing. I can do it by just adding edges until I make a tree, like shown below, structure with no loops in it. You can check that on a tree, any tree is automatically globally synchronizing because you can calculate all the equilibrium points very explicitly. Assuming some value for the theta one hat, um, then you can derive all, like say, knowing that this one is whatever, some value, in order for equilibrium to be satisfied, this one here has to be either zero or pi out of phase with that one for the sine function to be satisfied right along this edge. And then likewise, this one has to be zero or pi out of phase with this one. And you can just argue your way through the whole tree like that. So the whole structure is just zeros and pi's different from the initial or the, the first theta. 
But then it's easy to check the stability of all of those. And the only one of those possible equilibria that's stable is the one where everybody is exactly in phase, where they're all equal to theta one. If, if any of the theta j's are different from the theta one, there's a eigenvalue bound um, that you would learn in a nice course in linear algebra or numerical linear algebra that you can guarantee there will be an eigenvalue that's strictly positive, that's greater than this certain uh, Ritz estimate for a certain, you can plug in a certain eigenvector and use this bound. So anyway, the point being, no, none of these other states could possibly be stable. They all have at least one positive eigenvalue. So trees are the sparsest synchronizing graphs. They are automatically synchronizing and you can see this tree quickly gets itself into sync. All right, so trees play a special role in the rest of the analysis because if I have some complicated structure like this, and then I append, say, a single node with a single edge, or in general, even if I add a tree to some complicated graph. I don't want to go through this whole diagram with you. Here's the take-home message of the diagram. Um, appending a tree doesn't change stability globally. If you append a tree, if the original system was globally synchronizing, it will still be globally synchronizing even with the tree attached. And if it was not globally synchronizing because it had other attractors, the same will be true with a tree attached. Okay, a tree doesn't change anything. That, that can be shown by further linear algebra kinds of arguments, um, Rayleigh quotient and Hermann Weyl's eigenvalue inequalities. So here's a little example. I'm running a little simulation down here. Or did I already run it? No. There. Um, you can see something that has its little Mexican wave, but um, having that extra node attached to it didn't do anything much. Right, that's, that's still got the Mexican wave. Uh, so, did it right. sync up? Or did it sync up? Did it sync up locally? The, the ah, yes, the, the this part on the tree did. Yeah. I mean, that little edge did. But the rest of it, you can see, still has its colors. Is that what you meant? Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Good. Right. Um, good. And maybe there's another good time to pause for further comments or questions at this stage. Okay, so I'll keep moving. The, the point about trees, though, is not that I can add trees. It's more that I can delete them. So when we have complicated structures and we're interested in their stability, their global synchronization properties, we can sometimes answer how, whether or not they're globally stable by clipping off a tree and reducing the problem to a smaller structure. And then if that smaller structure is known to be globally synchronizing, then we know the bigger one was too. All right. So next, um, now the good part. Let's look for dense graphs that don't globally synchronize. So there are some things known Back in 2006, I had a couple of grad students, Dan Wiley and Michelle Gervin, who um, we were interested in these kinds of structures where you have a node connected to not just its nearest neighbors, but all of its nearest neighbors out to a certain distance. Like in this diagram, there's 32 oscillators. Each one is connected to 10 nearest neighbors on either side. So each one has degree 20. Right, 10, 10 connections on this side, 10 on that side. And that's true for everybody. Everyone is connected to their 10 nearest neighbors on either side. It forms this pretty dense symmetrical graph. And this one does not globally synchronize. It supports um, one of these Mexican waves that is attracting. So, there are relatively dense graphs that don't globally synchronize. On the other hand, if a graph is sufficiently dense, it is known that it will globally synchronize. So back in 1994, my student Shinya Watanabe and I showed that if a graph is complete, meaning every node is connected to every other node with unit strength. So there, the degree of each vertex is just the number of oscillators minus one. So the minus one, you're not connected to yourself. You're just connected to everybody else. That's what we have, we'll assume that throughout the talk. 
Um, in that case, with the fully connected graph, we could prove that that globally synchronizes. And that was sort of the state of the art for a while until a really nice breakthrough result by Richard Taylor in Australia. This is not the famous Richard Taylor of um, Fermat's last theorem fame. This is the less famous Richard Taylor, who is an Australian mathematician, um, who showed that you didn't need to go to fully connected, even if you were only 93% connected, meaning every node is connected to at least 93% of all the others. That ensured global synchrony, no matter how the pattern of connections was laid down. So you didn't have to pick a symmetrical 93%. It could be any 93% or more was enough. So he showed that with some nice linear algebra arguments. Um, I see a comment or question here in the chat. Let me see what it is. If you just consider graphs like the n equals 32 and degree 20 graph, is there a pattern to when it becomes synchronizing? That's what we're gonna do in the rest of the talk. <laughs> Um, these, this class of graphs that, that Joe asked about um, are circulant graphs, highly symmetric graphs with this circulant symmetry. Um, and so, yes, I will be looking at that soon. So you've anticipated where we're going. If I can have Yes, go ahead. Um, is there some kind of notion of always being globally synchronous? I mean, um, a positive density, um, we take a certain graph property that is dependent on the number of vertices. Let's say the density of the graph is um, n to the power three half, and then you take asymptotically and then a random graph with that, and then goes oh. to infinity, and then you want almost all of the graph to be synchronized. This is a wonderful question. So you can you can read yes, there are concepts like that, um, and I won't be touching on them today. This paper I mentioned by Ling and company from 2018 would be a good place to read. They have some nice results about random graphs and, and results along the lines that you're suggesting. Um, okay, thank so you. So yes, these, these ideas can be, you can give statements like, like what you're asking for, I think. I don't know, so my colleague Alex Townsend is here. Um, he's shy, but I might ask him to weigh in at this point. Do you wanna say, because Alex has some results about random, I should say random graphs, since he is British. Alex, do you want to say anything at this point about them? Sorry, there's a car alarm going off behind me. But uh, yeah, there's the, the, the Ling paper, the NYU paper, uh, does study random graphs and answers the exact question uh, that was being made here, saying if you're sufficiently dense and you let n go into infinity, can you guarantee with probability one that your odosh reni graph, for example, is globally synchronizing? So that is exactly in this flavor of look, studying random graphs uh, with a certain uh, connectivity property. I think that's what the question was. Yeah, yes, it sure sounds like it. And it's that's very exactly good. What it was very nice to hear that there actually. But, but there, there is still there is still a gap in the knowledge there with the fact yes. that we know that odosh reni graphs become completely connected when p when p with the probability of connecting two edges uh, is above uh, what is it. Uh, n n over log n, or is it, or is it one over log? N? What is it? Uh, log yeah, just one over log n. Just log n. Just log n. Log n. Log n. One yeah. over log n. Wait. <laughs> yeah, I think it's one over log n. n. N log n. N over log n is the total number of connections you need. N over log n is the total number of connections. So p equals one over log n. So that's when it becomes connected. But uh, the gap is that we believe that as soon as you have a connected odosh reni graph. We believe with probability one, it, it will be globally synchronizing as n goes to infinity. But we don't know that for sure. And the, the theory that we know is that P is much, the, the theory, the rigorous theory we know is P is much larger than that. So there's still a gap in our knowledge. Hmm. Okay, thank you. No, that's very interesting. Thank you, both to Alex and uh, let's see. So Jason asked the question, where does the 0.93 come from? Is it related to any fundamental constants? Well, I'm not done yet. No, it's not related to fundamental constants. Um, it's related to the temporary state of knowledge back in 2012. It, it was based on estimates um, trying to control the pr where the spectrum was. You know, you're trying to keep this, the spectrum of this certain symmetric matrix in, safely in the left half plane. And depending on your skill at linear algebra, Taylor got this bound to 0.93, but 
Ling, this paper I'm mentioning from 2018, did superior uh, linear algebra by, by working with matrices directly. Um, they're just very good at this kind of work. And they were able to shave the number down to 79%. And then there was this incremental progress very recently where Lou and Steinerberger brought it down to 78.89%. So this is what's happening right now in this field. Can we, br how low can you bring this, this constant, this prefactor um, within this world of deterministic graphs? Now, the question that was asked just a minute ago also raised this other issue of random graphs, which is another interesting direction. But anyway, the flavor is sufficiently dense graphs will globally synchronize, but how dense is dense enough? So that's what we wanna talk about next. So um, the state of the art is it's synchronizing if the vertices have all have degree greater than, if everyone's connected to at least, you know, about 79% of the rest. On the other hand, I mentioned earlier that my students and I showed that there's graphs with about 68% connection to everybody else that don't globally synchronize. So there, keep those two numbers in mind, 68 and 78 somewhere in between, we think there's, there should be some magic number such that above that number, every graph will globally synchronize and below that number, there will be counterexamples. So um, there, there was this earlier question about the kind of graphs that look like this. We're gonna call them WSG graphs because people do now in honor of my two students and me. Um, Wiley Strogatz Gervin is kind of embarrassing because they're just these trivial <laughs> graphs with nearest neighbor connections out to some distance. But anyway, so they can support Mexican waves um, that can be stable. Ah, keep doing that silly thing. So there's a Mexican wave on a little graph where you see each one is connected to its two nearest neighbors and also to its second nearest neighbors, but not more. Here's one that we showed earlier with degree 20 on size 32, and that one has its Mexican wave that is an attractor. But notice this one's getting pretty dense. This had like, this number is 64%. So we're getting close. Basically, as you take this type bigger and bigger, you can push this number up to 68%. So the generalization of this family of graphs is um, what we wanna look at next. These are these circulant graphs. So I'll, I'll just kind of blast through this. The, here's where the linear algebra comes in. If I try to write everything in terms of vectors, so a vector for the thetas, a vector for the cosines that appear in the Jacobian or the sines, this system can be written this way in terms of a diagonal matrix of the cosines and the sines. And so circulant graphs are ones that look like the ones we've just looked at that have this circular symmetry to them in linear algebra terms, they have constant diagonals. So these Bs are either zeros and ones. So like if it were all ones here for B1, that would mean everyone is connected to their first nearest neighbor on either side. So it'd be ones here and ones here on the subdiagonal. And then the same is true out on these farther diagonals, either ones or zeros on each diagonal. So examples of these kind of circulant graphs are just nearest neighbor cycles, fully connected complete graphs, these WSG graphs where you, that we've talked about. Anyway, all of them um, are diagonalizable. That is, we know their, their eigenvalues and eigenvectors um, very explicitly using the discrete Fourier transform. So consider a state like this. This is the Mexican wave written symbolically. It says the first phase in this rotating frame, now remember with the hats on them, the first phase is zero. The second phase is just some fraction of two pi. So it's think of it as two pi over n, right? I divide two pi into n equal parts. And then if p were equal to one, that would be a state I would call a singly twisted state. Because as I go once around the whole ring, I've gone through one full cycle of phase, right? So if you've pictured it, it'd be, it would look like a twisted ribbon with a full twist in it. So p measures the number of twists. Or another way of saying it is it would be one full cycle of the red to violet color around the ring. If P were two, then you'd have two full cycles or two twists and so on. So these are different twisted states. And all of them turn out to be equilibria for these circulant graphs. So I'll skip this. 
So all the twisted states are, are equilibria. Here are some examples of them. Notice this one goes through one full cycle of color. This one goes through two because here you can see yellow going around. I get back to yellow halfway around. Here I have four full cycles and each of them is a possible, you know, these are equilibrium states. And so the question is, are any of those stable? Which of these Mexican waves are stable? Uh, that's one question. So since we know the eigenvalues, we can assess their stability. There's some complicated formula, but anyway, you can write it down. So given that we have so much knowledge of these circulant graphs and their eigenvalues, we can now just brute force search over all possible circulant graphs up to let's say size 50. Um, going up to 50, there are more than 3 million of them different circulant graphs, right? I mean, there's a lot of possibilities. Here's some examples of some. So there's a lot to check, but you can look for circulant graphs that would be maybe denser than anything we know about, but that are still have stable Mexican waves of some number of twists. So that's it for each N, each size, try all the circulant graphs of that size, record the densest one that is non-synchronizing in the sense, I mean, all of these have a stable synchronous state. Don't get me wrong. When I say non-synchronizing, I mean, they can also do something else that is stable. Okay. So um, here with n equals five, that's a little one that, that supports a Mexican wave. There you can see it doing its bit. That's not very dense. So what's being shown here is that number that we talked about, the 68 to 78%. Anyway, you get this complicated scatter plot of results. Maybe I should show a few more of them doing their things. Like here's a pretty dense one. I guess that's the densest of all out to size 50. And so we get these kinds of results for the density that we can achieve just living in this sub-universe of circulant graph. Now the upper bound above which we know everything is globally synchronizing is this number 79% that I mentioned has been slightly improved now to 78 something. But basically this dashed line is this uniform upper bound above which everything is globally synchronizing. If you want, you can do a little better than that by sort of conditioning on N and asking what's the best upper bound using the techniques in this paper by Ling, but N dependent. Then you get this jagged upper bound above which everything is still guaranteed to be globally synchronizing up here. But what you should be noticing is that there's this interesting no man's land or no person's land between the best information we have on the lower bound and the upper bound. What's going on in between? And so we don't really understand this to this day. Um, so I'm not going to solve that for you because we don't know how. That's the interesting open problem. What's going on in there? But we have some information. And so I'm going to finish the talk by telling you what what partial results we have about what's going on in this middle territory. Okay, so here's an interesting trick that allows for some improvement on what we can say just living in the world of circulant graph. <clears throat> At least up to what we did so far naively. There's a procedure that I'm going to call twinning, which is where you can take a node, like say this yellow node in the box, and replace it by two yellow nodes or three or as many as you like. And what we're going to do then is, I mean, you could sort of visualize it this way. Imagine that this node is itself something that you could look at under a microscope. And if you did that, when you zoom in, you discover it's not actually one node, it's really two nodes. But those two nodes are connected to the rest of the system in the same way that this single node is connected to the rest of the system. In other words, these two, well, they're connected to each other, but like these two will also be connected to this sort of, so to speak, single green node, right? Notice each yellow is connected to each green and so on. And you can do that with any number. So what I'm trying to say is I have a complete graph. I think of each node as itself a complete graph of a certain size, which is either size one or two or three or 10. And then I connect those complete graphs in a way that respects the original pentagon structure in this example. If you do that, then you can analyze the stability of this so-called twinned graph. Like it's a graph of complete graphs. 
it turns out that the stability of, of the twisted states for the twinned graph is the same as it was for the original graph, but it's a strictly denser construction. So you can, given something that is globally synchronizing, you can jack it up to have a higher density by doing this twinning maneuver. Okay, so if you do that, the density for the G taus, this family, grows up to this number, one plus the degree of the original vertices divided by the size. And so doing that kind of thing, you can see all of these, I'm now running through them, they're all still supporting their Mexican waves, just like the original Pentagon did. Okay, but so doing that twinning construction, you can take results that were sort of not very dense, and then all of them become asymptotically denser. So this is a way of building up to a slightly better lower bound. Um, and so here's the best known upper bound. We still have this gap of, of where we don't know what's going on. But, but using this sort of technique, we can improve the best known result, which was 6816. Uh, we can go up to, well, so this, this is from this paper by Canali and Monzon. They were the ones who had the twinning idea. We can also do something a little more complicated, twinning plus a little bit of additional edges. If we add some edges in a certain elaborate but kind of contrived way, we can barely improve what's known to 6828, but we're really struggling. And, and that's not helping us get close to this upper bound. So we still have this I mean, we're, we're sort of like hungering for scraps on the table. We really need a new idea to, to try to tighten these two bounds. Because I'm, as again, what I'm trying to do is I want the magic number, which will be sharp, that divides the two cases. So we thought we had the answer, but it turned out we were disappointed. This is the way research goes. We thought we constructed an example that was 75% connected asymptotically, but that was nevertheless non-synchronizing. We were so damn close. So these graphs that, that we constructed look sort of like this. Here's an example of one. Here's another example of one that's bigger. You'll notice that these numbers are going up in density. These have a really nice property. All of their eigenvalues are not positive. They're all either strictly negative, but there are four zeros. And those zeros are troublemakers because they don't tell you linear stability. When you have zero eigenvalues, you have to worry about nonlinear aspects of the stability. And we were hoping against hope that these states would be weakly stable, that they would have you know, good strong linear stability in n minus four directions and fingers crossed that they would be weakly stable in some nonlinear sense in the other four directions. That would give us a 75% connected counterexample. Didn't work out that way. It turns out if you let these run, I mean, it looks encouraging. That state looks pretty stable. I mean, you can let it run a long time. That one looks pretty stable. It turns out though, if you let it run long enough, if you perturb away from that state by a small amount, say 10 to the minus six, on a time scale of 10 to the 6, if you wait a million time steps, you will leak out along a weakly unstable direction and go to the boring all synchronous state. So this example that we thought would work doesn't work. It's so sad. <laughs> but it came so close that it leads us to conjecture that there might be some result out there that's asymptotically 75% connected that will in fact be stable. But we don't know. It's a conjecture. We think there's a hope for that, but we don't know. So it's at the moment, our best guess is 60. I mean, our best result is 68.28%. But um, we won't be shocked if somebody comes up with an example that's 75%. All right. So I only have a few minutes left, and I want to just finish with this, which is um, the circulant graphs only take us so far. Let us try another strategy. Let us try to just exhaustively look at all kinds of different graphs with no symmetry and just see what we can say by focusing on small graphs, using that thing I mentioned earlier about pruning away trees, see if that can help us.
All right. This requires very different techniques. Now we're going to remember, we're looking at equilibria by looking at this system of equations. That can be viewed from a standpoint of another branch of mathematics, algebraic geometry. You could write the sine functions of all these thetas as just a variable s. So s sub i now means sine of theta i hat. And c sub j means cosine of theta j hat. And if you just do a trig identity on this from high school, expanding it out, you get a product of sine and cosine. That means that algebraically speaking, this system is a polynomial system for the equilibria. It's in fact a quadratic system in the sines and cosines. So our problem is to look for all equilibrium points. They're roots of this big system of quadratic polynomials. There's also the constraint that sine squared plus cosine squared is one for each of them. So you have this big quadratic system and um, wouldn't it be nice to find all the roots of that potentially very, I mean, like n of 50, you're dealing with a big quadratic system. Well, because the, after all, there's these AIJs, you know, lots of zeros and ones. Still, there are techniques in algebraic geometry for exactly finding all of the um, roots with guarantees. I mean, it's not just numerical in the sense of like numerical methods. This is using strict results in algebraic geometry to certifiably prove that you've got every possible equilibrium, every root. And so our colleague, this is where Mike Stillman comes in. Mike Stillman is one of the world's experts in computational algebraic geometry, and he has created this package, Macaulay 2, that uses Grobner bases and other algebraic geometry things that I don't honestly understand, but that he tells me and people who know reassure me, he is getting every root. The only problem is he can't do very big systems. It becomes computationally intractable once the systems get too big. So he can analyze, like, and there are also too many roots. He can find every root for graphs of size like up to eight or 10 or something like that. But after that, it's just too big. Still, you can learn a lot by studying small examples. So let's look at some small ones. Um, we know that a graph like this, just two nodes, that's completely connected. That will synchronize by earlier results. This is a tree, so this will always synchronize. This is fully connected, so this will always synchronize. Right, we have existing results. So you can start listing what's known. Um, trees we know synchronize. This kind of thing, I mean, this one actually, this is in fact a, just a tree. So I don't need the pruning argument. This is just one connected to, sorry, z zero is connected to two, one is connected to three. You can unfold this. This is just a chain of four. This one though is interesting because this is a triangle with a single edge sticking out connecting to a single node. So that's an example of a tree appended to a triangle. I could clip off that tree and reduce to a triangle, which I know is fully synchronizing by the complete graph argument. So using this kind of argument, I can do a lot, except here's a case. This is an interesting structure. This is a cycle of four, right? If you unfold this, it's it just four connected in an ordinary cycle, nearest neighbor cycle. That's one of the problematic cases that has zero eigenvalues. It has a negative semi-definite Jacobian, right? It's not negative definite. It actually has some zeros. That can be proven by nonlinear techniques that Lee DeVille, one of our friends, came up with um, to show that this is, in fact, one of these disappointing cases where the Mexican wave is weakly unstable. It has a twisted wave, it's unstable. So this thing does globally synchronize. So I'll be saying DeVille, meaning these are candidates, but they actually are disappointing, they globally synchronize. So finally, these examples are too dense by the known upper bounds. So um, they're ruled out. And we can feed this one to Mike Stillman's computer package and that turns out to be ruled out. What do I mean ruled out? I mean, all of these do not, give us anything other than boring global synchrony. All right, so we can rule out everything up to size four. Now we can, they all globally synchronize, ho-hum. Now we can look at all the graphs of size five. This is how many there are for undirected graphs, non-isomorphic graphs of size five. Okay, you can start playing the same game. And again, you can rule these out by trees, these by pruning, this by Lee DeVille's argument. These are too dense. 
these are ruled out by computational algebraic geometry. This is the only interesting candidate for something that might have another attractor, and it does. This is the known pentagon that has a Mexican wave. Okay, but we already knew that. So that didn't tell us anything. And by the way, this is not very dense, so this is not of great interest, but at least it's something that has another attracting state. Okay, now you go to size six. There start to be lots of graphs, um, but again, you can rule them out by the various arguments, leaving you with three candidates. And those three candidates are interesting. If you look at them, the first one has a Mexican wave, the second one is a Mexican wave with a stub attached to it. And the third one is something new. The third one we're calling an exotic Mexican wave. There you can see it's a triangle attached to a pentagon. And that actually has a structure that is not a boring Mexican wave. That one actually does something that we didn't know about before. So Mike Stillman discovered that one for us through his methods. Unfortunately, it's still very sparse. And so using twinning and adding and all those, I mean, this doesn't help us. There are some examples that could potentially help us um, that would give us dense enough structures, but so far they've all turned out to be disappointing. So we, we have not really been able to use these methods to um, improve on our best known results so far. So that's as far as we've gotten. We don't know what the densest graph is that does not synchronize um, and I, you know, part of me wishes I could tell you the answer, but part of me is happy that I can't because it's more fun this way, right? There's things for you all to do, and maybe one of you will come up with a good idea for, for beating the world record. Okay, thanks a lot. I'm happy to take any other questions or comments. Thanks a lot. This is really interesting. And yes, uh, if anyone has any questions, please do ask. I think I'll start off now. Okay, um, sure. Can you say something about, um, so you mentioned that as uh, a problem of finding sparse graphs, the do synchronize is boring if post the way we did it, but um, how do you make it more interesting? What type of things can we? Yes, that's right. It can become very interesting. I did not plan on showing you this in this talk, but I think if I jump out of this talk and open up a different one, I could show you, I really ought to add, add, add one more picture to this talk. Um, I don't think I have it here. Do I? No. Um, excuse me for one second while I close this one and show you an other, a different version of this talk where I have a picture that's relevant. Let's see here. Um, So here's a version of the talk that Alex gave, which has a certain diagram I want to show. So let me find it. I think it's down, it's in here, it's one of these hidden ones. There. Is that visible? Still, I have something on the screen for you. Yeah. Ah. Gah. Can I not play that? What happens if I say play? Come on. Steve, what do I need to do, Alex? You need to say un, uh, unskip. So if you unskip. Like, mm -hmm. Okay. You come back uh, up. Let's see. Hold on. Need to go out of here. Sorry, I'm not the best at Zoom. Alternatively, I can share the screen if you want. <laughs> I mean, I could show it at this small scale if people can see it. It, I don't need to worry too much. Um, Yuri, is yeah. this visible to you? Yeah, this is good enough. I mean, let me do that. Okay, so the way of making the question interesting is allow one loop. Rather than saying a tree, I mean, trees are boring for the reasons I gave. Suppose you say, what if I have a cycle like this? And now I ask, uh, I mean, we know that cycles can have these Mexican waves, but how many edges do I need to add to a cycle in order to destroy all the Mexican waves stability? I mean, does that question make sense to you? To destabilize all the Mexican waves, how many, what's the fewest number of edges I could add to destabilize all of them? 
And so our answer is that um, we have found examples of graphs that are of size two to the m, um, but whose connectivity is asked, and, and you know, this number I was talking about earlier that was 68% or 78%, we can basically add so few edges, just a logarithmically small number of edges, that the density is effectively zero. It's as if each one is, so in other words, nobody is connected to a, an asymptotically non-zero fraction of the rest of the graph. It's only logarithmic rather than growing like n. And yet we, we can destabilize all the twisted states. So here's an example of such a very sparse graph. Um, this one with 32, but degree only nine. And none of the twisted states are stable for this. So I guess if I play that, I don't know, will anything happen? No, not really. But anyway, trust me that none of the twisted states are stable for this. Um, we believe that all these graphs are globally synchronizing. However, we don't have a proof of it because all we did was rule out the twisted states. We did not rule out all the other possible attractors, which could be some of these weird states of the type that Mike Stillman can find, but that we don't have formulas for. So, so that's an interesting question. What are the, what's the smallest number of edges you could add to a cycle to be sure to destabilize everything? We think that it's asymptotically zero will, <laughs> will be enough. Just logarithmically small number of edges would suffice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Right. But we, as I say, we don't have a proof of that. Does anyone else have any questions? Yeah, maybe if I can. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Um, has anything been attempted with trying to, instead of having normal, um, what are they called? So the matrices for the graphs, so adjacency matrices, you have weighted adjacency matrices. Because I could imagine if you have a system where you have, you know, a large clique, that should all kind of stay correlated and do the same thing. And you want to replace it by one point, which is connected to all the others multiple times. In that sense. Um, we have not done that. That's, a, of course, a very good idea. We've, we've done the absolutely minimal thing where all the edges are one or zero. And including weights, of course, opens a big universe of possibilities. Um, there, there is some literature about weighted graphs and all, but not in this context, as far as I'm aware. So that would be an open area. I, I'm not, I mean, Alex, do you know of anything or does anyone else? I don't know of results in that direction. No, I know not, of nothing. I mean, it's going to get a lot more, it's going to get a lot harder if we can't understand yeah. that simple problem. Then we haven't even attempted the more tricky. Yeah, no, I thought maybe it would be a good idea to simplify just because, well, at least if you have a large clique in like this kind of system, does right. the clique tend to be in phase always? Uh, yes. Really the case? yes. I mean, it would, it just depends on how the members are connected to anyone else besides yeah. the, the clique. So, I mean, one thing I've thought of as a, to try to salvage that 75% result that I mentioned, um, I have proposed, but we haven't done this yet, that what if we allowed three strengths, if we allowed zero, one, and epsilon, or negative epsilon? I mean, I think there's something wrong with our formulation. The, the, the thing that's killing us and causing these zero eigenvalues is that the sine function has some extra symmetries in it. It's extra degenerate. We just have one harmonic, you know, from the standpoint of Fourier series, the sine function is very special. It has one term in the Fourier series. So I think we, either we should make the, the sine function more general, like we should perturb it with epsilon sine of two phi or, or epsilon plus other harmonics, or we should make the edge weights not have to be strictly zero if we allowed some epsilons. I think any of those kind of perturbations would bring us into, I think we could prove a lot of the results we want and then show that our result with the 75% is sort of an edge case as epsilon goes to zero. And we haven't done this, but I think that would work. On the other hand, you could view it as cheating because we've changed the problem. So that's the question. I mean, we would still like to solve the original problem and we don't know how yet, but it might be a good strategy to enlarge the problem as you've suggested, Misha, by allowing weights. And I think it might be productive to just barely allow some epsilons. 
um, along with the zeros. That might be something you could do. Thank you. But, but you could allow much more general weights too. Yeah. No, thank you. Interesting answer. Uh, yeah, or maybe negative epsilons. I think that might be helpful. I'm not sure. Right now we have only zeros and positive weights. Anyway. On a related note, so could you bring up the exotic Mexican wave? I think it's- Oh, yes, sure. So that was from Slide this other- Slide 25 on the one in there? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll find it. That's okay. from this talk. And let's see. So that's back yeah. uh, here. Yeah. Okay, would you like to see it again? Uh, yeah, um, that'll be nice. Sure. Good. Okay, yes, did you want to? Yeah, I think what that? has happened is the, the three, the triangle on the top has synchronized up, right? And so what, what my, what I was trying to get at was if we could somehow group up the parts that get locally synchronous, and then if we would consider this triangle as a singular node, then what we are left with is a four cycle. But now the triangle is somehow adding a weight to the pull so that the four cycle becomes a stable equilibrium of the Mexican wave. So um, it's an interesting idea, but I don't believe it's true that these are actually all in phase. I okay. agree that it looks like they're all red at the moment, hmm. but um, I think that they are slightly mm -hmm. out of phase. Um, it's not that these three can be collapsed to a node. This came up the last time I gave this talk and Alex came in and rescued me. I think he said that, cause uh -huh. he's the one that computed this or made these movies. These are, now let's see, the phase difference between these, what, what did you tell me, Alex? These are 80 the degrees the out of phase? Loop. Yeah, the ones on the outer loop are 80 degrees out of phase. So like if I call this one zero, this would be 80. Yep. This would be another 80 this way, like negative 80. Yeah. 80. So the, yeah, and then yeah. The, two, the two on the, on the triangle, not, not that edge, but the one on the outside edges. Yeah, they're that's- 20, they're 20 degrees out of phase. 20. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 very, it's almost like two cycles struggling both with their own, they're trying to make two Mexican waves stable at the same time, but neither it, one quite achieves. Yeah. Goal. I mean, so I tend to think of it as a triangle attached to a pentagon, but Alex has this nice point of view that this is a hexagon competing with a pentagon. Oh. And that they each, the hexagon and the pentagon are each trying to have their own Mexican waves. But yeah, so these are not, I mean, what? So these two, are these two actually in phase? No, they're 40 degrees. They, they are actually 40. Yeah, I think you should play and that. Then, and then this is 20 here. Hmm. Yeah. 20 on those edges, 40 here. And then 80 on all of those. Yeah. yeah. Right, huh. That adds up, right? Four times 80 would be 320 plus another 40 makes 360. Right. So, so 80, yeah, 80, 80, 80, 80, 40. And then 20, 20 instead of 40. <laughs> and we, we can do larger examples where we stick two big cycles together with the connecting edge. So like, like a figure of eight hmm. uh, and get, get global, get uh, patterns forming just like this one. But, uh, okay. Yeah, it's not too hard to make all kinds of interesting patterns with sparse graphs. It's, it's the, hard to make them with dense graphs. That's the problem. But yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Let's see, I see something going on in the chat, which is um, Jan asks, has there been any more precise comparisons between these graphs and physical systems of synchronizing oscillators? Not yet. Yeah, not yet. So this is extremely idealized. For instance, picking the, all the frequencies to be exactly equal, that gives us the gradient structure, but in real life, you know, the frequencies will be slightly off. And so any physical example will have non-identical frequencies. And same thing with the edges won't all be exactly the same strength. So we're really living in a pure mathematical world here. But but still, you know, you can find a lot of literature about, I mentioned Kuramoto who gave us this this class of problems to think about. Kuramoto's model has been shown to relate to 
um, superconducting devices called Josephson junctions. So I've done some work on them myself. Those are relevant to um, detection of very tiny magnetic fields. And so if you look up the literature on Josephson junct, actually Josephson is a Cambridge professor. It's very appropriate. We should be talking about Brian Josephson. He's, I, to my knowledge, still alive. Brian Josephson is a Nobel laureate for his work on the discovery of what's now called the Josephson effect done at the Cavendish labs um, back in 1960s. Um, he got his Nobel prize in 1973 when he was only 33 years old, I think. And um, so yeah, Professor Josephson is a great expert on superconductivity and he predicted this funny effect that if you have two superconductors very closely spaced by a, with an insulator in between them, a Cooper pairs of electrons can tunnel across this insulating gap. It would be classically forbidden, but quantum mechanically it's allowed. And it leads to these amazing effects that are now called Josephson effects that have lots of applications in of um, superconducting technology to all kinds of things, detection of tiny electric currents, magnetic fields. They're used for instance to detect in a patient with epilepsy where they have uh, an epileptic focus in part of their brain, diseased tissue that could cause an epileptic seizure. Doctors can put helmets on these people and non-invasively detect where the abnormal currents are in the brain using the Josephson effect to detect these tiny magnetic fields caused by these currents. Anyway, so um, I mention all that because in the Josephson effect, the sine function actually comes out of the quantum mechanics. So it really is correct to, to see the sine function in that context. But anyway, let's see, Jason says, is it gonna look very different if the edge strengths are scaled up or down uniformly? No, that wouldn't make any difference. So the zeros and ones don't cause any harm. If we, if we had zeros and twos, it would be the same thing. We can scale that out. It will just change the time scale. Joe asks, I said before that having X instead of sine X would be less interesting. Yeah, are there other functions that give particularly interesting results? Well, that's not really known. Um, I would think for instance, if you did sawtooth functions or triangle waves rather than sine waves, that would still be probably pretty tractable. You might even be able to do some piecewise linear analysis on that. Or, or step functions might be tractable. Um, but not much is known. A lot has been done mainly with the sine function for good and evil. It would really be helpful to do other functions. It's kind of ridiculous the way research goes that, that people make progress in one direction and everyone goes down that path very deeply. But if you just stray off into a different path, which is something that undergraduates are very good at, you'll probably start making discoveries immediately, you know, because people have groupthink. It's ridiculous. So um, you should do that. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, the person who started the whole subject was my mentor, whose name was Art Winfrey. And so Kuramoto was building on Art Winfrey's work. And Winfrey did all of this when he was an undergraduate, actually at Cornell. Um, back in the 1960s, he was the first one to study large systems of coupled oscillators, which previous generations thought was totally hopeless because these big nonlinear systems couldn't be analyzed. But Winfrey made a lot of discoveries because he was an undergraduate who didn't know better. So, you know, let that be a lesson to you. And if you want to read more about some of these people and their history, I wrote a whole book about this called Sync. Um, not Sync like kitchen sink, Sync like getting in sync. S-Y-N-C. And um, you can learn more about who Winfrey was and who Kuramoto was and, and this whole story. It's, it's pretty exciting. Okay, okay, so I think we should probably stop. I've kept you long enough. Maybe. Uh, I have a question. Okay, but um, I'm happy to take other questions. <laughs> uh, some, some of the graphs you have shown, if you consider the fireflies, they cannot form into that graph. Uh-huh. You mean um, because the, why, why do you say that about the fireflies? Um, so if a point is connect, so in terms of the fireflies, if a firefly is connected to some of the other fireflies, then these, among the, those fireflies, they should be connected, some of them. Uh -huh. So imagine uh, the fireflies connected to that particular firefly. It's like uh, the points on a sphere, then some of the points on the sphere will have a distance uh, less than one, which can be identified as connected. Okay, interesting. 
Yeah. So, so I think if I understand your point, you're, you're saying that we haven't really talked about spatial structure, particularly yeah. like we should be thinking about distance and spatial connectivity, not just pure abstract graph connectivity. Um, yeah, I mean, like in the case of the fireflies, they often assemble themselves in trees along a one-dimensional riverbank. You could approximate the problem by thinking of a chain, a one-dimensional chain of oscillators with certain maybe local networks in the chain or something. And those often do support wave propagation, but you could have more exotic things. Anyway, it's, it's really interesting to think about oscillators arranged on cubic lattices in three dimensions or on, you mentioned spheres. You could put them on any structure you want. You could put them on manifolds and let them look at their neighbors out to a certain distance. So there's a lot to do and people have done a lot, but there's a lot remaining to be done. Another thing that's interesting is not if we use fireflies, but if we use crickets, I'm not, I don't remember, do we have crickets in England? Like in Cambridge on a summer night, would you hear crickets chirping? You might, right? Or, or not. I certainly, we have them in Ithaca, New York. But I mean, why I mentioned crickets, or uh, I don't know if you would call them. Is that a standard concept? I don't know where crickets live. Yeah, okay. So crickets can chirp in unison, right? They will sing and chorus in unison, some species do. And, um, but there, the time delay due to the finite speed of sound is interesting. So another generalization is to think of time delays in the propagation of signals. Um, here we've assumed everything is conveyed instantaneously, but that's not really true. The speed of light is fast, but the speed of sound is not. So interesting questions would be like, imagine a, a group of people in a stadium and they're trying to clap in unison but there's a, it's a very big stadium, so the people far across from you sound time delayed, right? You don't hear their clap. Even if they're in sync with you, it doesn't sound like that. So thinking about these problems in the framework of time delay would be another very interesting problem. <clears throat> Much more complicated, though. I mean, you, you could also think <clears throat> of these problems as uh, spin Hamiltonians, right? Because the Kuramoto model basically describes the process of gradient descent to like the minimum of the spin X, Y Hamiltonian. <clears throat> nice. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this is a very um, dissipative dynamics. Um, if you did a Hamiltonian dynamics, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, it's a day of lecturing. I'm losing it. <clears throat> All right. Was your suggestion to think more about the Hamiltonian version of this problem instead of the gradient version? Well, I guess so. I mean, they're, they're basically equivalent, aren't they? Uh, well, Hamiltonian systems conserve energy, whereas these are, are losing energy. The gradient systems are dissipative. Right. So okay. if you had a second derivative, if I had theta double dot rather than theta dot, then you would be doing the Hamiltonian version of the problem and you would have a conserved energy. So I, maybe I should have said at the outset, um, these are extremely dissipative systems. These these um, are losing energy, they are not, you, you have to think of them as um, sort of driven and damped. They are not conservative systems. So if we had replaced the theta, like, yeah, it's a strange class of systems from the standpoint of classical mechanics. You mentioned the XY model in magnets or XY spin systems. So those are often studied in the dissipative limit um, where it'd be effectively like, the spins have zero mass. Um, but if you have significant inertia so that there's a second derivative term, an m theta double dot term, that's another whole universe with different properties. And um, if you have no damping, then there are no attractors. So the Hamiltonian version of the Kuramoto model would be complicated because the long-term dynamics of Hamiltonian systems is more subtle than the long-term dynamics of dissipative systems. But that's still interesting. I mean, you could try to do that problem too on all the various graphs and, you know, spatial structures. So you can see there's a lot to play with here. Um, but yes, good, good question. What does energy correspond to in this setting? The energy in the problem that we were doing? Yeah. What, what exactly is? Well, if we, okay. So yeah, if, let me go back to the governing equations. We'll see. Um, let's escape. No. 
oh wait what's happening why am i i would like to be able to scroll well i can always do it this way i suppose so um ah, okay so yeah if you look at this system up here um you could sort of think of this classically mechanically as these terms like i i want to write m theta double dot like think of this as mechanically a damping term right this is a velocity so if i had a, a constant in front of it times a velocity that's sort of like a particle moving through a viscous medium experiencing a stokes drag proportional to velocity so you could kind of think of a damping term, a frictional damping term, a constant times a velocity. There's an invisible mass times a theta double dot, which would be a inertia term. I'm trying to write F equals MA, right? So the MA would be this invisible mass times theta double dot. There's a friction force. There's this driving force. So this omega is like a constant torque, which is trying to make everything spin around on a circle. And then this is a coupling interaction, some kind of weird coupling force due to effectively like nonlinear springs. So the earlier question from the student who said, get rid of the sine function and just make these thetas, that would be like torsional springs between any pair of oscillators, if you want to think of it as a mechanical analog. And so anyway, as to the question of what is the energy, the, the potential that I wrote down could be thought of as the potential energy stored in the springs except these are kind of like nonlinear springs because of the sine function. And there would be a, an energy associated with the work done by the torque. There would be energy dissipated due to this viscous damping. And then there would be kinetic energy due to the inertia, which is not visible because the masses are all zero. So yeah, so there is a definitely a mechanical analog of all this in energy terms. Okay. Thanks a lot. I think we should probably not keep you any longer. Um, Very good. Okay. You. No, you was a, a great audience. Thank you, guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you to everyone who came here, and thank you once again so much, Professor Stroggers. It was a very interesting talk.